Well, hello and welcome to News Center. I'm Ashmit Kumar. Now, global hospitality chain Hyatt Hotels says that it's seeing pent up demand, which is being driven by leisure travel. Speaking exclusively to CNBC TV 18, Mark Hoplomazian, president and CEO of Hyatt Hotels Corp, said that leisure travel has exceeded pre pandemic levels. Highlighting the headwinds, uh, Mark added that high interest rates and remote working are impacting the hospitality sector. He further said that India's G20 presidency is a big opportunity for the hospitality sector. Leisure travel was clearly significantly higher than it was pre-pandemic, 20 to 30 percent higher. Okay. Um, group travel, that is corporate meetings, is um, approaching somewhere between 85 and 100 percent, depends on what market around the world you're in. Sure. And, um, and finally, uh, individual business travel is sort of in and around 80 percent recovered. Um, it's varied over time, but subsequent to, in the United States, subsequent to the uh, Labor Day weekend, uh, which was the beginning of September, uh, we saw steady increases in business travel. Uh, we're seeing it in India. Mm -hmm. So I would say um, it is recovering. When we talk about travel going forward, uh, we had Reed Hastings of Netflix uh, mention a while back that the biggest competition for Netflix uh, happens to be people going to sleep. <laughs> uh, he wants people to stay awake and watch Netflix. Uh, similarly, we had Mercedes India, their management here. And when they were here, they said that uh, uh, when we talk about uh, people buying cars, people buying Mercedes, their biggest competition is people actually investing their savings in mutual funds. So SIPs was their biggest concern. Hmm. Looking at ahead at 2023, what, according to you, is the biggest challenge, biggest concern uh, facing height? Wow. Uh, I think the demand picture is fantastic. Um, supply of new hotels has been slowed down significantly. Sure. And that's pretty much true globally. Okay. Uh, in the United States, that's been partly the result of uh, some challenges in raising capital. Mm -hmm. In China, serial lockdowns have really created disruption on, on work sites. Uh, in India, I think it's a combination of both of those things. But uh, new supply of hotels has actually been muted, more muted. Now, this means that with rising demand and more limited supply, you're going to see continued strength in hospitality, which I believe is going to be true. But I would say, as we now move into a time when more people are going to be traveling more freely because travel restrictions have come off, uh, proof of whatever your COVID status is has largely fallen away, international uh, schedules for airlines are starting to increase. So all of that is a positive sign, but we're going to have more limited new hotel supply. So I would say that's probably one of the biggest things that we need to figure out as we move forward. What about work from home, hybrid working, virtual meetings? Is that not a concern for you? It is. Uh, it is. It creates uh, some more limitations on people traveling on individual business trips, but also creates more need for companies to convene and, and have people get together. So I would say it's, un it's unclear to me how significant of, a, of an impact that's going to have. Of course, there is some negative impact if, you're, if you don't have people in the office all the time because a lot of times individual, if you're gonna go see someone for a business trip to Bangalore and they're not in their offices, there's no purpose to the trip. Because what are you gonna, there's no place to go for the meeting. So instead, what do you do? You get on Zoom or something else. However, companies realize that if that persists, they need to actually maintain the culture and keep people connected. So sure. they're going to have more meetings. So I think net net, there will probably be some impact, but I think overall, uh, not significant. So India is known to be a very competitive market when it comes to hospitality. Uh, so give us a sense of what this Hyatt strategy will be going forward. Uh, are you looking firmly at organic growth uh, or are you also looking at interesting opportunities that may perhaps present room for inorganic growth in terms of tie ups, partnerships or takeovers? I would say uh, our focus is going to be primarily on organic growth. We have a very broad uh, brand portfolio. Not all of our hotels or uh, all of our brands rather are represented in India yet, <laughs> but they will be. Uh, but we're, we're opening uh, some hotels this coming year. We have a, a brand called JDV by Hyatt, which is um, very boutique lifestyle oriented hotels. We have another brand called the Unbound Collection, um, and both of those will, will be new introductions sure. this coming year. Uh, the Unbound Collection Hotel is a palace in Bhopal. Um, so Nur Ul Sabah is the name of the palace. 
Um, very excited about that. That actually will open the following year, but we're, we're beginning the works on that. Okay. Um, so we have a lot more room to grow, just organically. Uh, Tie-ups are interesting because I think one of the things that we are focusing on is well-being okay. and also how that ties into uh, cuisine and, and how you're sure. eating more healthfully and, and looking after your holistic well-being. Okay. So I think we have more opportunities to bring more well-being practices into our into our programming globally, but also in India. Uh, and food and beverage has been one of our core strengths. Uh, and we're continuing to double down on that effort to okay. and so if there are if there are interesting partnerships that, that come along in those in those areas, we would go towards them for sure. Uh, India is ho is hosting the G20 presidency. Uh, that is something that the government is very bullish on. Uh, the government, in fact, uh, is hosting very many uh, delegations and conferences across 50 cities. Uh, so give us a sense, uh, is that an opportunity trigger for you? And if yes, uh, are you looking at perhaps uh, banking on this in the form of perhaps ties up with the government or in terms of hosting the wide population of delegates, scholars, corporates, etc., who will be traveling? Yes. No question. I think the G20 is going to be a big boom for India. In fact, as we speak, uh, there's a group of delegates that are in, in their first planning session in the Grand Hyatt in Mumbai uh, right now. So, it, it, you know, I think that this is going to be something like over 250 meetings uh, and, and gatherings over the course of the coming year, sure. which is, uh, as, and as you pointed out, across many different markets. So I think this is going to provide a tremendous level of exposure for India. And, uh, and yes, it will be good for our business, and we have every expectation of being fully participating in that as much as possible. British multinational bank HSBC is also betting big on India. The bank says it wants to be the leading wealth manager in the country. Speaking exclusively to my colleague, Yash Jain, Nuno Matos, uh, global head of retail banking and wealth for HSBC, said that the bank will continue to double its investment in the country. Take a look. We want to be the leading international bank for the emerging affluent, the affluent population and the high net worth population in India, and we are excited to do so. In Asia, we have four top priorities, mm. and India is one of those top four. We've seen a lot of exits happening in terms of global banks from India. Uh, what are you seeing differently uh, from them? And also on the other side, what are still some of the challenges which you see uh, in India as far as your operations are concerned. We have almost a half a billion people in the middle class now mm. in India. Mm. In our target, if you want, we, we want to bank around 40 million customers in India, the emerging affluent, affluent and high net worth population. Mm. So we are seeing that expansion by the day. And we are seeing the future in this economy. It's a stable economy, political stability, opening up to foreign investment. All things are lining up to be, to be, if you want, one of our major, major bets. We want to deliver wealth services to our customers. Mm. We want to be the leading bank for NRIs. Mm. We are the only bank that has presence in the US, the UK, in the UAE, in Singapore, the major corridors for Indians. And also, the consumption is growing tremendously in India. We are also lending to them through credit cards, personal loans, mortgages. And we are digitizing our services by the day. To speak about the retail banking operations, you said 40 million people is the pool that you have that you want to cater to in a country like India. Uh, what are your plans uh, in the next three to five years in terms of getting a good share out of, out of your expertise, that is the 40 million client base that you have? What is the kind of investment also that would really follow your plans here? Sure. India is receiving a lot of investment from HSBC and will continue to double every year. We continue to make more and more investments to grow our presence in this, in this market. Mm -hmm. On the wealth space, well, I'm just going to, to remind some of the things we are doing. Mm -hmm. We just acquired l and uh, investment management, exactly. right? That brought us more than 2 million customers just to, to, to start with. And we are going to continue to invest in that asset management business. Mm -hmm. We are going to launch in 2023 private banking in India. Okay, so that's a big event for us. We are going to deliver best-in-class services, best-in-class products. On the insurance side, we want to continue to grow our presence in this market. And we continue to improve our platforms and products for customers. This is on the wealth space. We want to be the leading wealth manager in India. 
We are also, if you want, increasing our presence on the lending side. We continue to improve our credit card business, our personal loan business, and our mortgage production continues to grow by the day. So these are two, if you want, two very critical areas for us to continue to invest and grow, and you should expect an HSBC much more visible in the market, much more proactive. Well, with that time now to slip into a very short break, but coming up on the other side, an exclusive conversation with Uber Senior Vice President Tony West. That's up on the other side. Welcome back now. Uber sees India as an important market with an enormous opportunity for further penetration. Speaking exclusively to me, the company's Senior Vice President and Chief Legal Officer Tony West said that they are the largest employer in the country after the Indian Army and Indian Railways and have unlocked 44,600 crore rupees of economic value. West added that Uber is open to providing social security benefits to drivers in India, but cautions that it should not be hard-coded into the law. Here's a slice of that conversation. I would say the, the biggest competition is seizing the opportunity. Um, when you think about the, the India market for us, which is an incredibly important market, we're already in over 120 cities. We have over 3 million driver partners uh, on the platform. Uh, we've been able to serve and had the privilege to serve over 100 million riders since 2013. Um, it's an enormous, enormous market uh, opportunity, um, and yet uh, only about 0.5 percent of the, the country has been penetrated. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really, when, so when you think about the, uh, the enormity of, of the opportunity yet to come, uh, how we are able to do that, how we're able to make sure that there are great product market fits uh, in this market, how we're able to ensure that we continue to innovate, that I think is our greatest competition. That's interesting to hear. But before we dive into what uh, the Indian market and how it's done for you and what your plans are for the future, uh, let me ask you about a couple of broader uh, global questions. Uh, I think it's, I'm talking about the R word. Uh, everyone's <laughs> talking about it, 2023, uh, hard landing, soft landing. We're discussing what kind of impact the recession is likely to have. We're looking at high inflation. Uh, the cheap money is out of the window. We're talking about high interest rates, yeah. rising fuel costs. That's a big concern. That's right. It's a big concern. Uh, Absolutely. So can you give us a picture of how you're gearing up for it or what the estimated impact is likely to be for you, for Uber? Well, I'll tell you, um, the business remains quite strong, and, and we're fortunate. Uh, globally, the business remains strong. When you, when you look at um, the United States, when you look at Europe, we're certainly um, you know, trying to make sure we're well suited to go through uh, any, any difficulty we might see on the economic front, on the macro front. Um, it's interesting, of course, notwithstanding some of the, the, the clear macro hurdles you, you discussed, when you look at the Indian economy, um, in, in, the, in the global context, you're talking about 6% GDP. I mean, that's, that's pretty much as robust as it gets uh, these days. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that here you've got uh, a growing economy with great opportunity, you've got great digital growth, you've got a great uh, workforce here, uh, young people who want to be engaged in writing the next chapter of the Indian success story. Um, and we want to be a part of that. But are you experiencing or likely to experience perhaps any short-term headwinds uh, in terms of your business growth, going, given that these are concerns yeah. which are now pinching the pocket with people now uh, managing their plans and their finances accordingly? Well, again, you know, we, we haven't seen that yet, but, uh -huh. but we are being very, very prudent and very careful. Um, you know, you may have heard that uh, our own CEO, when asked about layoffs, has you know, taken that off the table uh, at this point and has said as long as we continue to execute in the marketplace, as long as we're continuing to make sure we're being very prudent about the way we, we allocate our, our capital, uh, and as long as we remain focused on, uh, on uh, EBITDA uh, progression, uh, on profitability, on uh, free cash flow positivity, mm -hmm. um, and we continue to see the results that we're seeing, um, then I think we're going to be well suited to withstand any kind of uh, macro environment that we may encounter. I think in part you preempted my next question, but I'll ask you <laughs> well, That's good. I like that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm referring to the subject of layoffs. That's been one yeah. common theme across a lot of big tech players. We've seen the likes of Meta, uh, Twitter, Amazon. Uh, they're looking to rationalize their costs in gearing up for what they feel might be a cold winter. Uh, just your sense uh, as to what gives you that confidence that we haven't seen any layoffs yet but are we likely to experience them in the future? And yeah. if not, at least a, a hiring cap or a hiring freeze, maybe? Is that something that's likely? Well, so, you know, one of the, the things that happened during the pandemic is, you know, 
a, a lot of companies hired up during mm -hmm. the pandemic. We actually did the opposite. Mm -hmm. we, we went through a very painful period where we had some significant layoffs mm -hmm. around the world uh, at Uber. Um, we didn't know it at the time, but that actually positioned us well to withstand this current period mm -hmm. um, in a way that says we don't need to look at layoffs at this time. Now, that doesn't mean we're not being very, very focused on our cost structure, on bringing down costs. We're always looking for ways to be more efficient in the way that we're able to bring the service uh, of the platform to earners and to, and to users. Um, and we continue to, to be very, very disciplined uh, on costs. Speaking of costs, let's talk about the Indian market. Yeah. Uh, very recently, we had the APAC head for Uber uh, say that India is a high growth, profitable market, soon to turn profitable. Uh, can you give us some guidance as to uh, how the Indian market is stacking up for you uh, and what this profitability picture looks like going forward? Well, it's definitely uh, uh, one that is on that trajectory mm -hmm. to be a very profitable market. And, and that's going to be sustainable growth, sustainable profitability into the future. And, and that's one of the things that we're really excited about. Part of that comes from just the enormous scale of the business, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we are the, 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 the leading source or the largest source of livelihood creation behind the Indian Army and uh, the Indian Railways. Hmm. Um, you know, that, of course, is a great opportunity. It's also a great privilege and, and a great responsibility, something we take very, very seriously. And so when you look at how do we deploy in a market as incredibly rich and diverse as India's, uh, it means that we have to invest in multimodal. It mm -hmm. means that we have to give people a whole different uh, set of arrays of ways to get from point A to point B. It means that we need to collaborate with governments uh, and state governments uh, on, their, uh, on their objectives. Uh, and so, you know, for instance, a, a great example is uh, the partnership that we have with the Chennai Metro Rail Service mm -hmm. um, to help ensure that we're providing that last mile connectivity uh, in a way that helps to provide accessible, uh, economic, affordable, uh, transportation from point A to point B, whether mm -hmm. you're using an Uber product or not. Um, and so when you look at, you know, the opportunity, whether it's on two, three, four or more uh, wheels, um, whether that is a bus service like we've launched in Gurgaon, um, whether that is uh, auto rickshaw, which you have all over the country, uh, whether that's uh, moto or bike, um, we're looking for many, many different ways to take advantage of both the opportunity, but to also bring that accessibility of movement um, to, to India at large. It's interesting you mentioned that collaborative spirit working with mm. state governments as well as central uh, governments, which is in fact one of the questions that I had in mind, that uh, there was this one recent case in the Bombay High Court, it's traveled up to the Indian Supreme Court. Uh, the question essentially boiled down to, will Uber be compliant with the local regulations of the state or the central guidelines? Uh, is there a, a need, is, is there a concern uh, as far as Uber is concerned in terms of perhaps there being multiple regulations? Uh, is there a need for some kind of uniform platform, uniform regulatory framework that will govern services so that uh, one doesn't have to take upon oneself the compliance <laughs> burden of multiple states? Right. Well, that's where I think the communication is so important. I mean, Uber's quite used to working in an environment where there are sometimes conflicting regulations at different levels of government. Uh, the United States is a perfect example of this, where we have you know, regulations at the federal, state, and the local level. And we have to oftentimes work with like regulators to make sure we're harmonizing uh, compliance in a way, again, that meets their objectives, mm -hmm. but also facilitates innovation uh, and the ability of individuals to get on the platform, to earn, uh, to use that platform, and to uh, use it in a, in, a, in a magical way to you know, sure. sort of preserve that magical experience that we're all uh, now very used to when it comes to using Uber. Um, you know, and, I, and I think that's, that's certainly going to be true, uh, true here, and I think there's opportunity to do that. I mean, you know, if you look at uh, something like the Code of Social Security, which mm -hmm. the government uh, has put out. I mean, I think that uh, India is actually on the leading edge when it comes to recognizing that there is a category of gig worker that's just different than what we've seen traditionally between, you know, sort of either you're an employee or you're completely independent. Um, that this category of worker uh, not only deserves to have the flexibility that they choose, but that they're entitled to social benefits and protections that they deserve. Mm -hmm. And we wholeheartedly agree with that. We endorse that. We support that. Look forward to the implementation of that. But also want to say to the rest of the world that India is getting it right when they recognize that there needs to be a new framework 
that mm -hmm. covers the way that people are increasingly now choosing to work. You're making my job a lot easier because you're preempting <laughs> the questions. Uh, this, in fact, was the next question that I had in my mind in terms of recognizing recognition for gig workers. Uh, now, you, as you correctly pointed out and you uh, preempted my question, yes, there is a code for social security and that the Indian government, uh, like you said, is trying to recognize this. Up until it is uh, put into effect, it is notified. Is there some kind of framework that Uber is looking at to assist the drivers here in terms of so social security? Yeah. I want to be able to choose how to work. I want to be mm. able to choose when I can work. I really value this flexibility. But I should also be entitled to certain social protections. Mm. Um, if I get sick, I ought to be able to, to have some kind of protection, some kind of insurance. If, if I have an accident, I should be entitled to some type of, of protection, some type of insurance. Um, if if uh, I choose maternal leave or if I have some kind of uh, situation in my life and I can't work, there should be some kind of protection. We agree with that. We believe that is the future, that that is the way that uh, as people increasingly choose to work in a flexible way, that they ought to be uh, able to get those types of benefits that historically only employees were entitled to. The question is, how do you do that in a legal framework that's not set up for that? You know, we need to think about certain objectives. What are we trying to accomplish? Um, let's create a framework that is focused on principles, that's focused on objectives, that doesn't try to be too prescriptive, mm -hmm. but allows innovation to continue to, to change and allows uh, 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 companies to continue to grow and, and, sure. and as long as they are meeting these principles, as long as they are meeting these objectives. That's what the code of social security does. The conversations that we have uh, with a lot of these drivers and some of their platforms and unions uh, that speak to us say that there are concerns in terms of high commissions being charged, we're mm -hmm. not being paid as much as what we used to earlier. These are some of the concerns that emerge. Uh, but at the same time, you continue to say uh, that Uber provides employment benefits which are third after the Indian Army and the Indian Railway uh, uh, Service. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a sense of this picture as to uh, well, look, remuneration for drivers? Is yeah, that a subject of discussion? It's always a sub subject of discussion. I mean, you know, the reality is um, Uber's unlocked about 445 billion Indian rupees in economic value into this country by the operation of the platform. Mm -hmm. We can continue to create that type of economic value for anyone who comes to the platform for an opportunity to work. Um, how we continue to do that is making sure, that, again, that we're allowed to innovate uh, the technology in ways that make rides more efficient, um, that makes matching more efficient, mm -hmm. that takes into concern some of the pain points that drivers have identified for us, that riders have identified for us. Um, so all of that goes into the way we think about the operation of the platform and how we can continue to improve it. Well, with that, it's a wrap on this edition of News Center. News and updates continue right here on CNBC TV 18. Stay tuned.